Dodie, we're just incredibly lucky in the jobs that we do. We've got clever people all around us, Mm -hmm. brilliant minds, great ideas, just amazing technology. We're geeking out 24-7. We are. And our industry is just this hotbed of innovation and new things. And we learn about all these amazing discoveries and things that we come across, whether it's products and processes and ideas and new science, they become treatments, technologies, medicines, all of this stuff. And this, this is what we do our episodes on. Let's take a little step back from the techno joy of all the science and dig into some of the stuff around it. How do these innovations come to life, get discovered, get turned into real products and businesses that help advance and accelerate therapeutics? I'm game for that. So let's say... I might have a brilliant idea in biotech. How do I get it into the hands of the people that need it most and make a business out of it? Tell me that that is what matters. In this episode of Discovery Matters, yes it is. So, Connor, you're describing innovators. I'm going to give you an example of an innovator. A lot of the drugs that are at the the forefront of the industry today are incredibly expensive to to manufacture, obviously to develop as well. The core route to widening access and and making those available for a much broader range in in the world is to bring down the cost. So really the the focus of, of my work was looking at one particular unit operation in bioprocessing, downstream purification and understanding whether we could make a a radical step change to the productivity of that unit operation. Okay, this is cool. Who is this? And what is he talking about? This is Oliver Hardick. And yes, he is passionate about what his innovation can do. He is an entrepreneur, and he and his team developed a technology that can make significant impact on the speed of a particular important step in the biomanufacturing of medicines. So think about how you might want to speed up traffic on a monster freeway in the US. Um, So we're not actually changing the process at all. The same separation is, is still happening that is being used today. We're just enabling it to happen at a much faster rate. Um, maybe eight lanes that's just jam-packed with cars, right? The, the ability to, to get through that is going to be impeded by just the volume of those cars. And that's effectively what's happening in the current technology. Materials flowing through that very, very slowly. And the output is still the same. You still get to your destination. It just takes a lot longer. If you then imagine that same eight lane highway with no cars on it, you're the only one, you get to speed through there. Again, you reach your destination, the result is the same, but it just happens in a much shorter time frame. So, speed is the name of the game here. Same process, but faster. But oddly, that's not what I'm curious about. I want to know what it took to get a technology like this from an idea in an academic lab and into the big industrial processes that power biomanufacturing around the world. Yeah, I know what you mean. So really the question is, how did Oliver get his start as an entrepreneur? How did he spin up a startup? And then how did he get acquired by a big global supplier to the biopharmaceutical industry? Exactly. This episode should be subtitled how to make it big in biotech. So, you know your favorite saying? Every day is a school day. Uh Uh-huh. So none of this happens overnight. And for Oliver, it all began, you know it, at school. I love it. I love it that it began at school. The last VHS video that I ever watched in my life was uh, shown to me by my chemistry teacher during my A-levels. I was already doing a a sort of scientific range of of, uh, A-levels at at that time, um, but I didn't know what I wanted to do at university. And my science teacher, uh, she was called Diane Lobin Small, she played me a video which uh, the department at uh, UCL, the Bio of Biochemical Engineering, um, had made as a sort of presentational of what is biochemical engineering. I watched that and I thought that's, that's what I'm going to do and that's all I applied for and luckily I got a position there at UCL and and started that in 2004. So inspired by a great teacher I mean how many of us were actually that lucky um, 
just terrific. But look, what next? He made it to university. How did he go from an idea um, at uni into a business? In, in a short answer, through a lot of support and help from many, many different people. So the, the technology that we took out and spun out into Purify in, in 2013 was uh, something that I developed during my doctoral studies at, at UCL. That sort of move into into the entrepreneurial world was really spurred on by an, a number of factors. One was while I was doing my doctorate, I did um, some elective MBA modules at London Business School that UCL paid for, which was fantastic. I then uh, managed to get on an enterprise fellowship program administered by the Royal Society of Edinburgh. It seemed like a, a fun idea. The technology that I was working on during my doctorate was was proving useful so I thought let's see if we can do something more with it. Okay so lots of commitment, lots of support, hard work and an environment that fosters successful innovation. Easy right? I think the the environment is is really really strong. It's not just in in Silicon Valley and in, in the Bay Area and in, in Boston, but also in in Europe. I think we've seen the the growth of it over years. A, a number of of accelerator programs, a number of opportunities to to make that translation of technology wherever it came from, whether it's universities or or within industry and and, and being spun out. So I think the environment's really really strong at the moment. There's a lot still to be done here. The industry's fairly young um, as it comes. I think there's a lot to learn and cross-functional requirement in terms of expertise. So thinking about things like digitization and, and the power of data, big data, AI, internet of things. People talk a lot about it, and but, but ultimately that's the kind of input that we're going to need in bioprocessing, bio, um, biomanufacturing to ensure that we can make that drug cost as, as low as possible. So he did it. He got bored. And look, in the spirit of full disclosure, so we don't get accused of being corporate shills, we should say that the company that acquired Ollie's startup is the company that you and I work for and which publishes Discovery Matters. Yeah, we went far and wide to find this story. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just down, just down the hallway. Um, yeah, that's right. But it's a good story. So yes. anyway, enough of the advert. Back to the podcast. Yeah. Back to Ollie. Yeah, how does he feel about it now? Now that his business is part of a big global organization, has he had to sacrifice autonomy for scale, speed for reach? Good questions, and the answers are pretty nuanced. I mean, people like Ollie are insanely smart. He says the only way for a technology like his to make it is through being part of an established and influential company in the bioprocessing industry because of the nature of the industry itself. So he is absolutely on board with signing on for the corporate life. We've retained some of that that small company spirit in terms of innovation and, and speed of doing things, but we get the benefit of, of having that big company support as well and, and many, many, many decades of experience that, that comes with that, which is which is fantastic. For, for us, I think it was really the natural route. The industry that we're talking about here, bioprocessing, is incredibly conservative. And, and it needs to be because of the, the sort of safety and the efficacy of the drug products that are being made. So it was, it was that, that security of supply and ability to supply this technology into the, the, the big manufacturing players in the space required that big company play to, to sort of sit behind it and know that that technology was going to be available for, for years to come. Okay, what a story. So what has he learned and how are things different? The end goal is still the same, right? I think people really want to improve the industry and, and ultimately have an impact on, on the end patient. So I think I think that's that's great. That's nice that that is still there. The, the way that it's achieved, I guess, is, is slightly differently. I think uh, obviously approaches are, 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 are different, but I, there's still a, a fantastic amount of core research that goes on in, in, in this environment, which is, is fantastic to see. I think potentially one of the, the gaps is the ability to, to translate that. Obviously, as a, as a large company, everything is, is very much product focused and sort of immediately trying to tackle issues today rather than than potentially some of the, the longer term issues. But there's a, a balancing act there and, and being able to have a, a short term view as well as a, a longer term view. So 
So Dodie, you brought me an innovator. Thank you. That got us started. Um, I, I want to go back to something he said. He said school, um, the teacher, learning and the environment. Uh, there, there's a story, I, I believe it's an apocryphal story, but it, it illustrates the point uh, that, uh, that a, a science minister from an Indian uh, state came over to to the UK to to Oxford and I uh, said, uh, you know, we're, we're very impressed by your your cluster around the Oxford area. Can you tell me how we could replicate it? And apparently, a, a senior figure in the Oxford network said, "Yes, start a university, wait five hundred years, and then start to build your biotech cluster." The, the the point being that some of these things aren't straightforward and nor are they easy to do. Okay, who is this ally to your favourite saying that it all begins with education? My name's Steve Bates. I'm the Chief Executive of the UK Bio Industry Association, commonly known as the BIA. Steve heads the UK's Biotech Industry Association, which represents its members, and they're all companies of all different shapes and sizes in the UK biotech community. And he, he's also the head of the International Council of Biotech Associations. So he has this extraordinary kind of high-level global view on what's making uh, biotech innovation flourish in all the various clusters around the world. And Steve actually met Ollie and his team a long time ago when they were called Puritify oh. quite early on in their careers. All right. So I'm guessing that Puritify was um, part of those uh, mid early 2000s, that kind of startup language that was, you know. I know, it's brilliant, isn't it? It's like Spotify, Storify, yeah. Shopify, Salsify. Salsify. <laughs> we digress, <laughs> but uh, back to Steve. I first bumped into Puritify when they were uh, a competitor in a business competition called One Star, which enabled companies in life sciences to get some mentoring, go through boot camps, and ultimately compete for £100,000 and some lab space at the Stevenage Biocatalyst. Ollie and the team won the competition one year and I was invited to the, the, the finals and I, I met Oliver and I was having sit, sat through the pitch. I said, congratulations, I want to introduce you to my gang. You've got a pretty interesting idea and I think my manufacturing advisory committee would be a good network for you to get to know. And I think he was sort of blinking and drinking the champagne at about uh, about 11 o'clock at night but he, he did he did take my card and he did email me and then within a couple of months I'd got him into the manufacturing advisory committee I've said look there's this new company they're just starting out they're thinking about a, a very new way of doing a downstream process you guys should talk to him because you can tell him if this is something that's that you would work with how it would work and we've got a fantastic community on the manufacturing advisory committee here. and I think Ollie immediately found some fellow travellers, some, some, some soulmates who were he was able to bounce things off. And then that, I think, also enabled Ollie just to perhaps accelerate his thinking, his network uh, into a broader community that he hadn't yet I engaged with. All right, I hear networking. I hear connecting people. Champagne is always nice when you're doing that. But it seems that that, is, that networking and that connecting people is really important. Absolutely. It, it really is a case of not just what you know, because that is critical, but also who you know and who who you know knows, if you can get your head around that. Building the right network of talent and connections is just a key advantage. I also asked Steve what the common challenges he sees biotech startups having to overcome actually are. So I find all companies in BIA membership and in the life science sector in the UK to be unique, but they're usually based on a fundamental triangle of three things. Great science, great team, and the great money to support the endeavour. The science often needs to be supported with strong IP, so we find common sets of problems around getting that IP out of universities or away from, from other companies or organising that in a sensible way, so there's a common set of challenges there around organising that science. People uh, hiring your, your your first person, often your founder or your, your your chief executive, isn't the biggest problem. You've got to build a, an appropriate team, probably at pace and scale, and hiring person two to seven or understanding which of those people you can beg, steal or borrow from others or have part time or all the rest of it is where a, a strong network and a strong ecosystem comes in. And I think we see common challenges there around that. And then 
the universal challenge of funding. We see unique uh, opportunities in life science, but usually the common themes around which we find things is IP and science, the intellectual property around the science, building the team and the people and how do you do that, and crucially, how do you get the money and how do you get the investment to be able to move the organisation forward. And that links also to, to place. Uh, I know places like Audley Park or, or Stevenage uh, have schemes that can help companies grow and develop uh, and making sure you're plugged into that. And if you're not in a location like that where you're not getting access to those net, those networks or those support schemes, understanding that they are available in parts of the UK. So hold up a second. He said science, people and funding. And then he said Stevenage, is that a noun for the help you get from Steve? <laughs> <laughs> like leverage? I got me some Stevenage. That's great. I mean, he'd love that. It's close, but no. So Stevenage is a place <laughs> Can't in the UK. Can't keep a good pun down. We know that. <laughs> so Stevenage is just north of London. Um, the Stevenage Bioscience Catalyst uh, hosts and supports biotech companies in their transition from startup to commercialization. And, and these clusters or campuses, accelerators as they're sometimes called, they're usually connected to like a big anchor company, often a big pharmaceutical company that previously owned the site. And they have strong links to local academic centers. So the SBC... They're also called incubators, right? Exactly. We also call them incubators. incubators. and so on. Yeah. And the whole idea is to get, you know, innovation moving quickly um, so that mm. therapies and discoveries can be accelerated towards their, their end users as quickly as possible. So... Stevenage is the cluster where Ollie and his team first got started. So I wanted to branch the story out a little bit. And to do that, I spoke to Kath McKay, who runs Audley Park, another biotech cluster in the UK, this time in the north, just outside Manchester. Mm. And her thinking, as you'd expect, aligns really well with the macro picture that Steve paints of science, people and money being the cornerstones of a startup success. run an accelerator program which is powered by the BioCity Group and that takes small businesses or pre-businesses and puts them through a structured development program to challenge their idea, challenge their business model, challenge who their customers are going to be and really hone that business plan so when they launch they are geared for success. And actually there's a real role for science parks to grow innovative businesses, but also in terms of providing world-class facilities, open access laboratories, for example, and access to capital equipment. So Oldley Park is part of a UK network and actually in a field which is um, growing internationally. So does it work? Does Alderley Park have success stories similar to Ollie's? Yes, they do in spades. And it's not just technology, it's also services. Kath told me about a company called Apconics that was founded on an idea literally drawn on the back of a napkin. Classic. It's just amazing. They took it through Alderley Park's accelerator program. Let's hear what happened. And Apconics are a company that have expertise in safety pharmacology. So they uh, advise companies to make the best decisions. So drugs are essentially de-risked before they go into to patients. So the person who leads that company is an individual called Ruth Roberts. She went through, uh, I suppose, a, a series of challenges through the people who led that program and through the expert network. So putting her and her group through their paces to think about who is your customer, how will you make money out of this, who are your competitors, what do you add that your competitors don't already have, and just provided a series of, I suppose, robust challenges to that business plan and supported access to finance. An introduction to a chairman for that company was made as well. So there was some kind of hands-on experience in terms of landing people into that company that was that was provided to. And now, I mean, the success of Apconics is 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 very profound. They they are here with us at Ugly Park. They're one of our most successful SMEs. And um, last year, they opened up a European headquarters as well. So they're a company that we've really taken right from the back of a fag packet or back of a napkin idea to being a, a successful SME now with a European site as well. So science, people, and money, that triangle again, which of these is the hardest? So you're a step ahead as usual. I'd thought about this too. Mm -hmm. Maybe the science itself 
is not always that hard. I can just hear our audience screaming. Maybe it's not always the toughest part of getting a business like this up and running. It's all the things you need to wrap around the science to make it into a viable company. That's correct, and I'm sure not everyone would, would agree with this, but sometimes the science is actually the easy part. It's taking that idea and turning it into a commercially viable product or service that needs the, that needs the support, um, and that's what we can provide here through the Accelerator program. And, and for Kath, it's the variety of the companies that she and her team are helping to grow that gets her really excited, and it's not just life sciences, but it's adjacent industries as well that can contribute to the success of these life sciences companies. We have companies now on our campus who are working in areas such as animation, virtual reality, gaming, and actually having that diversity of company on our campus that isn't just focused on life sciences will be really beneficial as we grow the site. We're seeing on the life science side more companies working in data-driven areas and digital areas. Digital health and AI in the life sciences will be, will be a huge growth area for us. So having companies on site working broadly in an array of digital technologies and in diverse areas will, will be really beneficial in terms of knowledge transfer and also that, yeah, the, the movement of people actually from company to company. So that's all somebody would need. A good idea, great people, access to money, and good support from a friendly neighborhood biotech cluster. Sounds so easy. It does, it does. But even that might not be enough. Back to Steve. I would say Ollie's experience is not unique, but I wouldn't say that there's 50 of these a year. I would say you can count them on two hands uh, on an annual basis. Sometimes those exits are, are integrations into global players. Sometimes they are the combination of, of expert groups together. Sadly, sometimes we see companies go out of existence because they've run their natural course, but those people are then, we see them pop up in uh, in new companies or integrated into companies which they've met in the network. So Ollie's experience is a, is, is a great story. It's not unique, um, but uh, but it's not uh, not something that we see every single day. So this is a complex ecosystem. And if we cut the jargon, it's that old adage that it takes a village to raise a child. Yes, it does. And everyone in the village has a stake and has something to contribute. But perhaps we should leave the last word to Ollie, which is where we started, because through all the challenges and joys, one thing appears to remain the same, the focus on making a positive Uh, difference. I see great things happening all the time, and I see the struggle that sometimes people have in terms of, of of moving those great things on into something that ultimately impacts patients or impacts the business in, in some positive way or has any other positive impact. And I, and I think that's that's what I like to try and do is to, to see what we can do better that ultimately has an impact. I have to say, this was a tough episode to distill. Steve, Kath, Ollie, they've got so much deep insight from so many different aspects of, of what makes a success in, uh, in, in biotech. But the one thing that I take away from all of them is just this passion for the purpose of what the industry is driving, a focus on better health and medicine for more people. And, and for me, that just seems like a good thing. And it seems like a never-ending thing, right? Because we've just scratched the surface. And every good idea just the good ideas are going to keep coming. And that's kind of the exciting thing that keeps the industry moving forward as well. Indeed. And I suppose, you know, some of them succeed and some of them fail and the people keep driving and popping up, as Steve said, in different places. Um, It's just a community of people that are just pushing the future forward. And that's part of the joy of working with it. So we hope that this episode of Discovery Matters maybe inspires you to get in touch with a colleague, with a neighbor, with somebody, you know, if you've got a good idea, go make it happen. And that's it for this episode of Discovery Matters. Thank you and see you next time. Bye bye.